From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. As more gardeners shop for native plants each year, more plant descriptions in catalogs and on nursery labels use the blanket phrase, pollinator-friendly, to catch our attention. But is that the whole story behind each plant that's so labeled, and how do we choose among the many named coneflowers or asters or heucheras and figure out which one doesn't just look prettiest to us, but does the best ecological job? We'll talk about that and more with Yuli Lorimer of Native Plant Trust. But first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. With me today to talk about how we can each become more informed native plant consumers is Yuli Lorimer, who has made a career of working with native plants. He was longtime curator of the Native Flora Garden at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and in 2019, he became director of horticulture at Native Plant Trust, the former New England Wildflower Society and America's oldest plant conservation organization, founded in 1900. Welcome back to the show. I'm so glad to speak to you as always. Yes, thank you for uh, having me back on again. Um, yes, you, how has spring been? Uh, it was good. Uh, I mean, it, in in the sense that uh, it was a very strange year with without the public here, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I, we unfortunately weren't able to open until a little past the peak for our uh, spring display. So uh, on one hand, it felt very privileged to be able to see it um, and have the whole garden to yourself, and on the other hand, it, it was certainly... Uh, felt like a shame not being able to share it with uh, with our members and the public. And you're all able to keep working. You've been able to stagger people and do all that to keep keep going, keep the garden going. Yeah, yeah we we've been very fortunate that uh, we're we're in a good position um, financially this year, and um, you know with some creative scheduling and mm. um, you know getting to work on some some. Um, work from home projects, uh, we were all able to stay fully employed. So very oh, grateful I'm for that. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad to hear that. Not the case everywhere, but very good news. Yes, um, indeed. We, we were very fortunate. So before we begin our main topic, I just want to say, I mean, so many people have been looking for online opportunities to learn more, and native plants are such an important subject and such a subject that's in demand and desire uh, from so many gardeners. And you guys have a lot of great courses, and I just thought you could give us a couple of sentence pitch about those, and then I'll give the link with the transcript of the show to where people can browse the course listings and so forth and maybe register for one. Yes, uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, public programs and, and education is, uh, is a big part of what we do, um, and so we offer uh, uh, two certificate programs, um, which are uh, sort of designed to to get you through a sort of a basic certificate in um, uh, ecological horticulture uh, and botany and field ID, and then there are also advanced certificates uh, in botany and conservation. In addition to that, we also offer uh, a wide variety of classes and field studies, um, almost all of them now online, of course, because we still can't have classes in person, um, but touching on everything from um, design, um, basic you know, gardening for pollinators, um, plant families, sorts of things, gardening for plant diversity, plant ecology. Um, there's, there's a whole slate of, uh, of courses that are there, um, and I'm sure that there's uh, something for, for all of your listeners. Oh, definitely, and in, including me. <laughs> Very tempting list. So, um, yes, well, good. Thank you for that, uh, that synopsis, because uh, great stuff. So, yep. I confess, Yuli, I feel like I know a medium, intermediate, advanced, intermediate amount about native plants, you know, for a gardener, for someone who's not a a scientist or an ecologist or whatever. But I confess that even I am totally overwhelmed a lot of times. And I said in the introduction, you know, the coneflowers, like, I think there's nine species 
in nature of echinacea, but now there's like a zillion named cone flowers in the garden center. And then I read stories with headlines like 12 of the best echinaceas to grow. And it's like, help, you know, <laughs> maybe yeah. we should be begin with a sort of explanation of what's a straight species, what's a selection, a cultivar, like kind of a 101 on what are we seeing? What are all the sort of versions of what we're seeing of native plants yeah. as consumers? Well, yeah. Let, let me begin by saying I completely agree that the the amount of choice is bewildering, um, and even for for professionals, it's hard to sort out all of the different options that are out there. Um, and I can certainly see as a um, as a home home gardener or um, somebody just getting into uh, interest in native plants um, that it's really hard to figure out where to begin. Um, so, to answer your question. Um, we can define um, species of plants as uh, plants that have evolved um, uh, with a sort of distinct suite of characters um, that includes, you know, geographic distribution, their morphology, the way that they look, um, and increasingly some degree of genetic distinctness. Um, and they're naturally occurring. So these are things that uh, humans have not had any direct hand in creating. Um, and there are a couple sort of sub-levels that people might uh, encounter that include subspecies and varieties and forms. And these are things that, you know, like the pink-flowered dogwood, for example, that may occur in nature every so often in a population of white-flowered dogwoods, um, but uh, stable enough um, that it gets to be called a form or variety. Okay. Um, so so there's, there's that. Um, now... Uh, species can hybridize with one another uh, as long as they're within the same family of plants. Um, and so um, two sort of classic examples are oaks and um, amelanchia. And um, oaks, you know, we have a lot of different kinds of oaks here, and wherever their ranges overlap, there's a chance that they can hybridize with one another. And so out in the wild, you find individuals that have sort of intermediary characteristics between that show, you know, something from both of the parents. Um, huh. So you can have naturally occurring hybrids. Then the next part of the definitions are where humans get involved, and, and that's where we begin to make uh, hybrids uh, of plants that would not normally meet in the wild. Um, and so, you know, a great example would be, um, uh, I think, one of the more well-known hybrids to come out of my former employer, um, which is the yellow-flowered magnolia, uh, magnolia ex brooklynensis. Okay. And so that was taking a, a magnolia from eastern North America and introducing it um, with full consent uh, to a <laughs> magnolia from eastern Asia, uh, and then um, looking at the progeny of that cross and selecting certain individuals for, um, in this case, in the case of the yellow magnolias, who were looking for yellow flower color and later bloom time so that there wouldn't be less of a risk of frost damage in the spring. Okay. And so to come out of that are named cultivars like uh, Magnolia Elizabeth, um, Hattie Carson, just a couple of na name a few. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so again, this is human hands creating something for the purpose of, of you know, wanting a different color or for uh, uh, to to minimize the risk of of uh, of like frost damage. Right. Um, so, and then basically selections then fall into the category of um, you know, I am uh, I'm walking out in a nice meadow in the fall and I'm looking at a field full of little blue stem and I notice one individual that has just strikingly blue foliage. And so I collect seed from that, and I grow it, and if it's stable and continues to produce that blue color, then I can give it a name and I can patent it, and it becomes a, a selection or a cultivar of a native plant. And that's even done, I always use the example, even in like, tomatoes. You know, a brandy wine, I say, is not a brandy wine, is not a brandy wine, because if this seed company and that seed company and the other seed company, if they're all seed farms, if yeah. they are growing it on and growing it on generation after generation and saying, oh, this one has the biggest fruit or the most fruit or the most disease resistance or fruits earliest, 
and they're selecting their seed crops for subsequent years from those fruits, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's not just with native ornamental plants or native plants used in ecological landscapes, but this is with plants, yes? We can make selections. Yes. We're not interfering, we're steering. I mean, we're not yes. crossing, we're steering, I think, yes? And I think this also brings up a really important distinction is that um, that if you're collecting seed from a parent plant and growing it from seed, you're going to expect a certain degree of natural variation. Mm -hmm. And this, to your point, that a brandy wine isn't a brandy wine isn't a brandy wine because if you're growing it from seed year after year, there's going to be mutations. There might be something a little bit different, and you're selecting for, you know, big big fruit or particularly red skin or you know yeah. whatever the characteristics are. Um, and the distinction I want to draw here is with plants that are patented. Right. And so you see this also as amongst the, the you know, the bevy of choices uh, at the nursery, you see plants that have, you know, uh, the letters PP and a bunch of numbers after it, uh, or, uh, or even a little sort of patented trademark. Um, and so these things were registered um, with a plant patent office, and in order to be registered, they have to be cloned. And this is a really important thing for your listeners to understand right. that any plant you buy that has those numbers on it or that's patented is genetically identical to every other one that has that name. So it's not produced sexually. It's nope. produced by cloning in a laboratory environment where little pieces, cells, whatever, are replicated to make more plants asexually. Yeah, or... Or they could be done through stem Div cuttings or root cuttings, but essentially right. cuttings, and uh, you know, and they're cloned. Right. Um, okay. And so, but would that include is, it, tissue culture, laboratory propagation? Is also sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You know, I okay. mean that some some plants uh, um, are difficult to propagate that way, and and so yeah. we've overcome those hurdles with tissue culture techniques and lab okay. techniques, and then others uh, lend themselves to, you know, uh, taking a stem cutting and dipping it in some rooting hormone, and there you go, uh, and off it goes. But so, so the, the, the important part here is that there, there's low genetic diversity in patented plants, and they have to be cloned asexually in order to receive the patent. So I'm inferring then that low genetic diversity is not the way nature intended it. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, it, that is. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, you know, part of what makes... So uh, a real sort of, to get to like a really fundamental point here, um, plants cannot get up and move if conditions become tough. Right. All right? You know, they, they're, they're literally rooted in place, and the only way they can move around is by dispersal. And so because they're stuck in place, the, they rely on uh, adaptability to survive. And that adaptability, the core principle behind adaptability is genetic diversity. The more right. diverse the genome, the more likely it is to develop novel mutations that lead to survival. Okay. So it's a very, you know, very clearly stated that plants with lower genetic diversity don't have as much of a chance in nature um, to adapt and change. Okay. So you're a native plant person with a lot of expertise. You've made gardens and consulted and probably advised people and written about it and spoken about it. what When you go shopping, if you took me shopping and I was bewildered, what would you want me to get about this, you know, in that sort of, like, I'm looking at tags. I mean, does any of, is any of this besides the patent number or the PP, whatever it is, um, AF or whatever it is, um, on the label? Does, any, does it hint at it? Um, you know, what am um, I, how can I be a smarter so, shopper? Because, and also, which of these things are better or worse from Yuli Lorimer's point of view as a native plant expert? Well, so there are two, two big questions here. Um, I mm -hmm. think one is, um, so if you see a, a name in single quotes behind, um, behind the, the botanical name, if you'd like, um, then it is a cultivated variety. Um, mm -hmm. If you see a sort of trademark name 
um, let's say um, you're in the market for Baptisia and you see Twilight series and a little trademark and then a uh, another sing- a name in single quotes, um, that means that these are are human created uh, plants, um, and which is not to say that they should be avoided altogether. Um, and I think this is you know this is part of part of the 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 conundrum around this particular issue is that there's not enough information out there right now um, mm-hmm. to really make informed choices. And so there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Uh, and, and we can talk a little bit about, you know, people who have begun to address this. And uh, as you might expect, the answers are not linear. I mean, they favor species over, uh, over cultivated plants in terms of ecological function and pollinator preference. Um, but they're outliers. Mm-hmm. The other big issue, I think, is that plant labels in the nursery um, don't give you all the information you need to be an, an informed and educated consumer. And maybe that's purposeful. Um, and, you know, maybe that's part of what people need to ask is, you know, want to know how is this plant propagated would be one question to ask your nursery person. Um, secondly, um, were any pesticides applied in growing this plant. And I think right. that's, a, that's an, another aspect that people don't think is important enough to ask. But if you want to be pollinator friendly, regardless if you're using species or cultivars, you can't do it if your plants are soaked in pesticides. And so are we just talking about the neonicotinoids and neonics, which are systemic uh, chemicals that even I think are applied to the seed in, in, yeah. as well as in the plant, you know, once the thing is growing, I, I think there's a couple of uses for them, and they're persistent yeah. in, in the plant, even when you bring it home, yes? Yep. The, they're by far, I think, the, the number one offender, but there, there are other uh, products that people use um, uh-huh. to keep plants, you know, quote-unquote, bug-free so that they can look beautiful at the nursery. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the issue about genetic diversity, which we're trying to kind of un, unpack and unfold here, is certainly an important one, um, but I don't think as important as um, finding out about whether or not these plants were um, treated with neonicotinoids. Okay. Okay. So, you know, you, you buy native plants because you want to support pollinators, which is a great thing, and everybody should do that. And you don't want to find out after the fact that the plant that you bought uh, uh, indirectly or unwittingly poisoned the very things that you're trying to support. Right. Right. Um, so that's cer- certainly a, a, a really important question to ask. Um, and, again, if enough people ask it of nursery, uh, uh, you know, nursery managers, growers, um, you know, they will either, they'll have an answer for you, or if they don't, then, you know, perhaps it's time to look for another place to shop. Right. And a lot of them are proud to display the information saying that they are free of neonics. I mean, the ones that are ahead of it, who have been getting ahead of it, I think. Because if you do that, if you make that commitment as a nursery, you should showcase it because it's a perk. It's an, it's an extra dimension of desirability for a certain consumer, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's so many, you mentioned series and so forth, and there's so many series and a lot of times of, you know, of a lot of perennials and, and so forth. And sometimes they look too good to be true to me, like the flowers are too big or too double or too, and I'm suspicious that they're sterile maybe, they're not usable mechanically by the insect that might have used the straight species? Is there sort of this misfit thing that plants are bred, or I know there, that there is, plants are bred for my eye appeal as a gardener, but don't match the needs of the original insects who co-evolved with the original species? Um, I mean, like Mount Cuba Center in Delaware and, and other places, University of Chicago, have done trialing to see whether, you know, whether that's true or Dick Lighty, excuse me, not Dick Lighty, who was at Mount Cuba, but um, yeah. Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware, you know, has research teams exploring the utilization of, of cultivars, or he would call them nativars versus the straight yeah. species. So is that another part of this that you 
worry about? I mean, I assume. Yes. I mean, absolutely. I think that that still um, the the driving factors for the creation of this bewildering array of choices is aesthetics. Yeah. And and it's based on on sort of broadly on consumer preference, which um, uh, which the, the sort of the top things that they like are um, what are what could be called novel flower morphologies or double flowers. Yeah. And there's a lot of double flowers, and they may look really pretty, but if you're swapping out the organs of the flower that actually make the nectar and the pollen for more petals, they uh, they serve nothing for pollinators and for insects. Mm. So. Um, that's one extreme. Um, and then being bred for a shorter stature or bigger flowers or longer bloom times, um, uh, you know, it's unclear, and this is, again, one of these places where more research is, is needed, uh, what effect that has on the quality of the floral resources. Right. And then to Doug Tallamy's point that um, when you begin to breed plants with drastically differently colored leaves. Mm. Um, the insects that feed on those don't recognize them uh, either visually or they don't taste the same as, you know, the straight green leaves that they've evolved to feed on. Right. So those are all sort of things that, you know, in, in the pursuit of, of, of beauty in our eyes, um, we have we have changed these plants so that they're less functional for these other relationships that they've evolved with. And that's, right. my, that's my concern with this big issue. Me too, and especially one you hinted at, which is um, the dwarf, the sort of making things smaller for garden size, um, average garden size, or that look good in a pot in spring, that they bloom early, they can make them bloom early in a greenhouse and then put them out so that we all want to take all of them home. And that doesn't necessarily suit either a long-term garden plan, frankly, or the insects and other creatures who could utilize them. So those both worry yeah. me. Um, I wanted just to ask you, we have, you know, a couple few minutes left, two, three minutes left, and I just wanted to ask you what other things you'd love, you know, a couple of bullet points, whatever, that you'd like to make sure that we have in mind when we're doing our homework and figuring out what we're going to shop for, especially for um, this summer for fall planting and so forth. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think more broadly to to think as holistically as possible with your with your garden planning, and that you know the garden is not just for you; it's for all the other organisms that rely on these plants for food, for shelter, for uh, um, uh, forage. You know, there's all of these wonderful relationships. Um, I think most people want to see a garden that is alive with life, and um, so to, to think of your plant choices as uh, being driven by what's best for all of them. I think it's one of these things is that you can have your cake and eat it too. In other words, you can build gardens that are aesthetically beautiful uh, and pleasing for us, but then also um, maximize the support that you can give to all these other organisms. And... It's not just insects, it's the things that eat insects. It's all the way that all of this life is interconnected. Um, right. and so just sort of generally speaking, you know, think holistically and not just from the human's perspective of, like, what do I want my garden to do for me? Yeah, the food so, web, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's, frankly, it's depressing to talk about the losses of birds and insects and so forth. And I'd much rather focus the conversation about positive things that you can do to support the maximum amount of life in, in your little pocket um, and hope that, that, you know, what you do connects with maybe what your neighbors are doing and that on the sort of local to regional scale, we can actually really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think inherently it's a very hopeful message. It's not one that sometimes feels like, you know, we're trying to tell you what you can, you can't plant. Right. Um, and, right. And to figure out what we want to plant and what does that job that best that you were just, those jobs best that you were just describing, that's why we need to look on the Native Plant Trust website and at those course listings because I think there's a lot of information there for us to become more discerning choosers and users of native plants, you know, so 
again, I'll give the link with the transcript. I'm always, I always love talking to you, so we have to do it more. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Kindred please. spirit. <laughs> so thank I you. Thank you very much, Yuli Lorimer from Native Plant Trust, and I'll talk to you again soon. All right, great. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. Brushwoodnursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Thanks to all of you for listening, and don't miss an episode. You can subscribe to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes, or and you can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or Facebook and Instagram as at Away to Garden, and happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of AwayToGarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. <laughs>